You need to love God more than you love the others. And that happens at the cross. You cannot do it. But at the foot of the cross, it says in the side of ages, as you reflect his sacrifice, the more you understand that love, she says, the more God fills your heart with his love, the more you love him, and the more you love him, the less you love the others. Let's continue. <clears throat> we uh, talked about the disciples in the upper room. You remember? They got together. They prayed for the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came, illuminated their mind, and they understood what? Only one gets A, the others. They understood the cross. The spirit of prophecy says they understood the cross. They started to realize that God himself, the most holy, that angels bow down and say, holy, 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 that they cover themselves in God's holiness and presence. God himself came on this earth and God took their sins. God took your sin. God took your sin. And died for you personally. Mary, John, whoever you are. God died for you. So you can live. When they got that, it says it just grasped their hearts. Melted. God's love compels us. Melted their hearts. And they finally loved him more than anything else. To the degree that no sacrifice, it says, was too great. To the degree that they forgot their needs. And they are ready to preach knowing that it's going to cost them their life. But they joyfully, it says joyfully, were ready to die for him and consider it a privilege. If there is something that you don't surrender, it means because you have not got the cross yet. And so, how do you surrender? How do you surrender? How do you surrender? I remember specifically, I remember uh, talking about surrender. We think, oh yes, all to Jesus, I surrender. We think that we surrender. We talk, yes, I am willing to give. How many want to die for Jesus? Are you willing to give your life? And everybody, yes, thank you, thank you. Don't hurry to raise your hand. I'm not judging. If you did, praise the Lord. But I tell you, we say easily, I'm ready to die for Jesus. But then we have hard time to surrender something small. Let me give you an example. When we came to America and I finished in, in Southern one year, I got my bachelor and then I moved to Andrews one year to get my master's. It was supposed to be three years and a half, but by God's grace, I did it in one year and a half. One year in the summer class, plus the field evangelist. When I got in Andrews, I was poor. I mean, poor, shiny, poor, broken, poor. And finally, I mean, I, had, I, I used the disciple's car. I walked. And I, I would walk to school when others would drive to school. And finally, I said, my wife had three jobs. I had two jobs. I took three years in one. And finally, we saved a little. 2,500, that's not a lot. But that was for me a treasure. We saved a little. And I said, I'm going to buy myself a car. No longer walk. I'm going to drive. So I took my good friend and he took me to auction because I had no money to buy a car from the dealer because then you make the dealer rich, you know. And so we went to auction and he was a dealer and he knew how to buy. He has done that all his life. He was an expert. He looked at the car and said, this car is going to sell for this price. And he was always within $50 close. And he said, Pavel, if you want a good car, you need to listen to me. I said, okay. And then he shows me that car. I don't like it. He said, I don't like it. And then I see a van Dutch Grand Caravan. And the van has TV. Now, today, TV is not a big deal. But in 1999, to have TV in the car was a big deal. Big screen TV, video games, lights, sensors in the bumper, all the whistles and bells that you never use, but you want to like, you know, to have it. You know? And so I said, I want that car. And it's only 2,500, my money. He said, please don't buy that car. I said, no, I want the car. It has TV. He went on carfax.com and he, and he said, it has transmission problems. It's too cheap to be good. Don't buy that car. This car should have been 15,000. It's only 2,500. Do not buy it. I want the car. He says, okay. He bought the car. I drove to the seminary next day. I went to school and parked in front of the seminary and left the door open. Hopefully, my classmates would take a peek. See the TV? 
Nobody looked. I was like, come on. You know? Nobody looked. And I was so happy and so proud. I drove the car about one month and a half, two months, not even two months. And I was driving on the interstate and my car got stuck in the second gear. Like, uh, uh, and then it, it was supposed to do, uh, but uh, 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 it would not switch to the third, the fourth, the fifth. It would not switch. It got stuck, blocked, frozen in the second gear. I, my engine was like, uh, and I was driving 15. Uh, I mean, you could walk faster than me. And the drivers were cursing, showing me bad signs with the finger and saying, get off the road. And I was like, oh, this car. And I stopped the car on the shoulder, turned off, turned it on. Oh, 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 you know, it's, oh. And I got angry. And then I calmed down and I prayed, Lord, I have faith. Please, nothing happened. God didn't answer that prayer. I even prayed for resurrection for the car. Nothing happened. And then I went home, talked to my wife. And, and, and she says, well, your friend told you not to. I said, I don't need that. <laughs> I says, honey, you have only one option, fix the car. Well, I went to the dealer and they said, 3,900. It is more than the car. So I went to my friend. He shook his head. Uh, he says, okay, let's go to junkyard. We went to junkyard. I found a second-hand transmission, I paid 450 for it, and then I paid one of my elders who was a mechanic, another 500, altogether 950, replaced the transmission, drove two weeks, and it broke again, got stuck in the second gear. I hated the car with a passion. Ah, I was like, don't ever get a Dodge Grand Caravan. If you have a Dodge, I will pray for you. <laughs> and so, I went back to the junkyard, Paid another 450, paid another 500 the elder, now, now two times 950. You talk about pff, 2,500 plus another 950 plus another 950 and fix the car and they say, I'm not going to drive it. I'm going to let somebody else have it. I put it for sale, put it on newspaper, put it on Craigslist, put it on Amazon, put it in front of the mall, in front of the Walmart, paper in the windshield, luxury car, big screen TV inside. <laughs> Nobody called. Like everybody knew. And I put 5,000. I said, hey, should be 15,000, only five. Because I wanted to recover my money, you know. Nobody called. And I dropped to 4,500. Nobody called. And I prayed, Lord, help me sell the junk. Nobody called. <laughs> After two months of walking and keeping the car in front of the Walmart for sale, I said, you know what? I'm going to drive it until it breaks and then throw it away. And I will never in my life get this type of car. I drove to a church that I was preaching in, and I told them, we need to grow. We think because we are Adventists, because we have the truth, remember last night's message? Because we go to church, because we eat healthy, because we have the light, we think that we are okay and we are sleeping. We need to take one more step. We need to grow. We need to keep on growing daily. We need to fully surrender. We need to give it all to Jesus. And that happens when we see the cross. And when we see the cross, we love him to the degree that we don't love anything else. And I said, whatever you don't surrender and you love more than Jesus, that's what is going to lose your salvation. And I said, are you ready to surrender all? They said, yes. I said, are you sure? Yes. I said, me too. Praise the Lord. I said, amen. I had a prayer. I got in my car. I was driving. Lord, please, sell the, please help me sell the van. Please help me sell the Please, please, please. And God says, are you leaving what you preach? I said, yes, Lord. Do you surrender? Yes, Lord. Absolutely. Tell me what I do it. Your life. My life. Give me the van. Pfft, I need to drive it. Give me the van, give me the car. Lord, this is not Mercedes, this is a junk, I could give it to you, but I need to drive something. You give me a car instead and I give you the car. And God said, do you really love me? Yes, more than anything, yes, give me the car. Lord, should I give you the car, but I need it, how much do you pay for it? <laughs> I mean, if I don't have a car, how do I go to church? How do I go to school? I, I need a car, Lord. Do you love me? Yes. Do you surrender? Yes. Give me the car. Lord, I, I give you the car, but give me something. Do you trust me? Yes. And then God stopped talking in my mind. 
And I realized we talk a lot about surrender. But even in small things, we like to have control and to get from God what we want instead of God getting from us what he wants. And I said, Lord, forgive me that while I preach to others, I don't fully trust in you to seek you first and trust that you will provide because you are a good God. You gave Jesus. You gave Jesus. How will you not also in Jesus give us what we need? And I said, Lord, I desperately need money to buy a car. But you know that. I don't tell you anything new. So, take the car. If you want it free, free. It's yours. If you want to give me something, give me one dollar, whatever. It's your, it's your business. I'm not going to ask anything. It's yours. I'm going to surrender this junk. Take it. Use it. In that moment, my telephone started to ring. It was one of my church members or nurse. Pastor, do you still have that van? Yes. I want to buy it from you. No. Why not? Pfft, I want to sell it to a stranger, not to you. You'll curse me, you'll hate me, you'll never come back to church. <laughs> she says, Pastor, my brother fixed your transmission. He's the mechanic. You remember? I know about the car. Then why do you want it? And she said, you preached about surrender. I want to surrender all. And this is what I love. I love my time and the TV. And God impressed me to surrender my time and use that time to drive people to church, to drive people to evangelism, to drive our students to our school. And I love driving. So God said, use that gift. But pastor, I have a neon. You know, a neon is smaller than Mr. Bean's car. You know, it's really small. I have a neon and I need a big car. I need a van, but I cannot afford pastor to buy a new van. So God impressed me to get your van. But I don't have 4,000. All I have is about, I don't remember what she offered, 1,500, 2,000, somewhere there. Would you give it for that? I said, take it. Long story short, God helped us. We bought a Toyota, finally, a reliable car. <laughs> Sienna, okay. But then we moved after about, we got into the district. We moved after nine years. I went to Kentucky, another five, six, seven years. I met her long after, years after I was driving in vacation to Montana. And I met her. Hey, how are you doing? Good, you? I said, hey, did that car go for two months or three? She says, oh, I'm still driving it. I hated the car. <laughs> and she said to me, I did get your sermon, Pastor. And every day I give my car to Jesus and whatever you ask me to do, whatever, whatever he would ask me to do, I do it. I put him first. And since I gave it to Jesus, it keeps running. It never broke again. Amen. Who wants to save his life is going to lose it. And who is willing to surrender to, to lose his life is going to save it. And God is calling you to take another step. Let's go into the sermon. Listen carefully. It says there, he came down with the disciples and stood on a level place. And with him, there were two groups. Two groups. How many groups? Two. The disciples and a great multitude. Who was the multitude? Was the Romans? Was the Greeks? Was the unchurched people? Who was the multitude? Judea and Jerusalem. Who is that? The church. Am I right? His people. They keep Sabbath. They eat tofu. They return tithe. They know the doctrines. 2300 days and night prophecy. They, they are the church. They sing Kumbaya. They, you follow me? They are the good people. The people who go to church every Sabbath talk about this and that. They have board meetings. They have camp meetings. They, the church. But this is two, two, two different crowds. And listen carefully. They came to hear Jesus, the crowd. Why? To be healed. They came to eat. He multiplied the bread. Let's make him king. They came to be healed. They came that time and then left home. And then came another time and then left home. We talk about two crowds. The disciples, the disciples, they follow him all the time from morning to night, every day, 24-7. The crowd come, comes once a week. Do you follow me? Yes. They are seven-day Adventists. They are not everyday Adventists. The disciples spend 24-7 with Jesus. The crowds come once in a while. The disciples, Peter says, Lord, we have given up. 
How much? Everything. Families, lives, jobs. Let me remind you. Peter was a fisherman. Peter goes fishing. Peter was an expert. When I was in Romania, way back 200 years ago when I was young, I had a neighbor. His name was Dan. This guy was a fisherman from generation to generation. He took me fishing. And he caught fish after fish. And I caught nothing. And I said, man, you have a better rod. He said, okay. He gave me his rod. I took his rod. He kept fishing. I got nothing. I said, you have a better spot. We switched spots. He kept fishing. I got nothing. And then he would catch a fish and say, oh, this is a bass. Oh, I caught it from the left side of the mouth. He said, how do you know? I feel it. I didn't feel anything. Just that I didn't catch anything. That's all I felt. <laughs> he was an expert. Peter was an expert in fishing. Peter was an expert. He had the GPS that to show the fish under the water. He, you know, he knew you don't go at 9 a.m. to fish. You go at 4 a.m. He knew you don't go in shallow water, only small fish. You go deep water. He knew all the deal about fishing. And Peter fished with his buddies how long? The whole night. And caught? Nada. Nada. Zero. Not one fish. And Jesus comes and says, throw the net in the right side. Now, if you have ever been to the Lake of Galilee, not on the Genazareth side, where his mountain is very abrupt, but on Israel side is the beach, and it goes really slow. You go walk 20 meters, and you are up to here, and you walk another, and you are, it, it, it is shallow, and it goes slowly, 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 slow deeper. For Peter to fish, he must have been Far away. But for Peter to talk to Jesus without Jesus screaming, Peter, throw the net in. To talk to Jesus, he must have been at the end of the fishing, close to the shore. Shallow water. Otherwise, he would not have heard Jesus. For Jesus to say, throw the net in the right side. When the water is like this, and the right side is toward Jesus, is like, are you kidding me? There is no fish here. Jesus, you can tell me about salvation, but not about fishing. Let me tell you about fishing. It's 9 a.m., you go 4 a.m. Shallow water, you go deep. And we tried nothing. Jesus said, trust me, throw the net. Peter looks to his buddies and says, you are going to embarrass me in front of all these guys. Anyway, long story, you know the story. He caught so much fish that there was no room in his boat. He put the fish, and he put the fish, and the boat started to sink, and the net started to break, and he called, Phew! Everybody come and they came and they filled the boats and the boats started to sink. And it was like a pyramid of fish in their boats. And they said, whoa, if we sell this fish, we can get retired. We have so much money. And Jesus says, leave it and follow me. That's crazy. Why would Jesus want me to leave my job? Who gave me the fish? Jesus. Why would you give it to me and then ask me to give it up? Don't give it to me. Period. You give it to me and then you take it back? Doesn't make much sense. Why would Jesus give it to him and then ask him to surrender? Can it be that Jesus wanted to tell him, as I gave you this fish, if you follow me, I want you to know that I have the power to give you this to you every day. You could not catch it. I gave it to you. I want you to trust me. Let it go and follow me. Jesus, can I keep half and put in my retirement account and give half to the church, you know? Now, let it all go. Can I keep five fish, take it home and cook so my family? Can I take pictures? No, let it go. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. You understand? How much was he supposed to let go? Oh. All of it. How much? Oh. Let me tell you something, folks. God wants it all. Satan doesn't. Satan is happy with a little. If you keep a little, Satan is absolutely happy. Because Jesus says, all or nothing. Who is not with me is? Basically, if you just keep a little for yourself, that's what you keep for Satan. And Satan got you all. And we don't get it. We just want to keep a little. And whatever, you don't surrender, very little. That's what's going to choke your relationship with Jesus and lose your salvation. People who surrender, 99% are going to burn in the hell together with those who don't surrender. That's tough, isn't it? Yeah. You cannot just love Jesus with 90% of the heart. Either love him or you hate him. 
Well, I don't hate Jesus. I just don't surrender all. Exactly. You love something else, whatever you don't surrender, more than Jesus. I want you to remember the rich, young ruler. says, Lord, I keep the commandments. Is that good or bad? It's good, absolutely. I return tight. I go to church. And Jesus says, wonderful. I want you to sell how much? How much? And he, a good Adventist, turned around and left Jesus because he was not able to surrender all. Folks, whatever you don't sell, that's what's going to lose your salvation. And so, the disciples, they surrender all. And Peter says, Lord, I left everything. Because Peter was willing to let everything. That's the reason Peter says to Tabitha, wake up, and the dead woke up. Because Peter surrendered everything. That's the reason his, his, his shadow would go over sick people and they would be healed. Because he surrendered. To the degree that you surrender, to that degree, God can work through you. God cannot take a heart that is not surrendered and use it. Because Peter surrendered. Because Moses surrendered. Because Joseph surrendered. Because Daniel, because people, Paul surrendered. Because they surrendered, God could use them. The disciples gave up everything, follow Jesus all the time, and they are not in business in order to get a blessing. They are there to be a blessing. They didn't come to be served. They were there to serve the multitude. The disciples came to serve. The crowd came to be served. The disciples came to be a blessing. The crowd came to church to get a blessing, and they never got one. There is no blessing in seeking a blessing. There is a blessing in giving a blessing. The disciples came to follow Jesus. The crowd came to get something from Jesus. You don't come to prayer to get something from God. You come to prayer to surrender to God. There is nothing wrong to cast your, your, your cares upon Him. As long as you surrender first. We, in all the prayers that I hear, every time we go to God, 92%, 92.5 specifically, analyzing nine years of prayers, 92.5% of our prayers are centered in help me, give me, bless me, da, 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 me, 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 me. Very little, 7.5% is focused on God. Shouldn't be the other way around. Listen, folks. I want to just go a little deeper because we, we have no time. We need to finish. And we went three slides out of 43. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I went countryside to my grandfather from my mother's side and outside the city to my, my grandfather from my father's side. My grandfather from my father's side was beaten by the police for giving Bibles to people, was beaten by the police for building churches, was beaten by the police for starting new groups, baptizing new people, starting in locations where there was no Adventist, starting churches. He was not a pastor. He was a carpenter. And he always, always, as long as I remember him, he, by the way, he lived three centuries, and I mean it. He was born in 1898, 19th century, so lived two years from the 19th century, 100 years from the 20th century, and died in 2001, so one year from the 21st. So he caught three centuries, 103 years. And before he died, a few months before he died, he and his wife, my grandma, celebrated their 82 anniversary. Isn't that something? And I caught him one day. He had no, no more teeth. I caught him kissing her. I said, that's gross. Come on, grandpa. <laughs> 103, you don't even have to, you know, give me a break. Son, she is my heart. I love her more than in the beginning. I would die for her any second joyfully. That's what he said. Anyway, and so he, all the days, every day that I, I heard him, he was always singing, always whistling, always, 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 24 7. Like, Grandpa, why are you singing all the time? I found Jesus. Me too. You didn't. Yes, I did. If you did, you would have sung too. If you don't sing, it means you didn't find Jesus, son. I said, no, no, no. I did find Jesus. Then why don't you sing? He said to me, you're like beaten with a baseball bat in the head. What type of Adventist are you? <laughs> beaten with a baseball bat in the head. <laughs> he said, why are you sad? This is the best possible news in the universe. Jesus loves you. If God loves you and that he died for you, you should just scream and jump. And Why don't you sing, son? He said, you really, you, you found the theory of Jesus. You didn't find Jesus. You have no clue about Jesus. Because if you did, you would sing like me. <laughs> Do you understand? Yeah. 
and I asked him, I said, why other reasons you have to sing? He said, this is it, one. I said, but, but you must be happy for other things. I don't care for anything. He said, this is it. He's my treasure. Now, talking about my grandfather from my mother's side, tall guy, really tall, 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 taller than the door. He would go like this through the door, big muscles. I was at the grandfather countryside, and I was playing hide and seek with the neighbors, with the kids of the neighbors. And he was very, 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 very rich, extremely rich. And this guy had the old house that nobody touched, and the nice new big house, and properties, and sheep, and he had everything. And so I was playing hide and seek, and I got under the old house that didn't have a basement, had a crawling space, very, very narrow, and I got there in the corner where I would usually go and use two white stones to make sparks. And I went there because I knew these kids are afraid of spiders, and I have no fear, so they will never find me. And I got in the corner under the crawling space, waiting there for the kids. The kids looked all over, and then after about half an hour, they said, Pavel, we give up, come out. While I was there, I touched something. I said, this is curious. And I had a little, little, little flashlight. I turned it on. There were two big jars of clay filled with gold coins. That my mom told us like many times, your grandpa has a lot of gold that he got from the Turkish Empire that is very old, a lot. She said, over 70 kilograms of gold. That's a lot. But he, is, he doesn't give anybody a penny. And I found the gold. And I watched in Western movies when I was a kid that they put the gold between the teeth. So I took a coin, put it between the teeth, put it back. Then I got out. The kids gave up anyway. The Grandparents called us, it's time for supper. I went to eat, and I said, Grandpa, I found your gold. He says, what gold? I found the gold under the house. He says, you had a dream. Now, let's see. Sit down and eat. I said, okay, after we eat, I show you the gold. He said, I need to go to the bathroom. He left. I finished the food. Then he came back, like 15 minutes later. I said, let, let me show you the gold. I took him, flashlight. There was no more gold. He moved it. <laughs> he says, I told you you had a dream. I said, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. He hid it, and then he killed himself. And he died. And nobody knows where he put the gold. People have looked and looked. He dug a hole somewhere, and he, he hid it several times. He moved it from place to place, and then he killed himself. This guy had a treasure, but he was not happy. The other one had another treasure, and he was happy. Do you follow me? Yeah. You can compare the two. Now let me go a little, a little into, the, into the details. What are you singing about? What are you praying for? What are you stressed about when you go to sleep or when you wake up? What is your mind focused and preoccupied with? Because whatever you follow me is your treasure, that's where your heart is. Whatever stresses you, whatever you think about, whatever you talk about, whatever you deal with every day, that's your gold. And when you focus on the cross, your goal becomes Jesus. But when you focus on blessings, on things, your goal becomes something else. Listen carefully, the difference between the two. The man in the parable found the treasure, then he hid the treasure, then he sold everything, then he bought the land with the treasure. This is where we have a problem. We all find the treasure. When you have been baptized, I, you know, I found Jesus. I found Jesus. Don't we say that? But the problem is that we confuse finding Jesus with following Jesus. We think, I have decided to... But we actually think, I have decided to find Jesus because we just talk about finding him all the time. We never understand, yes, you found him when you got baptized. It's time for you to lose the diapers. You are born again, it's time to grow. You are 40 years old, baptized, spiritually 40 years old, and you still wear diapers and stink. We just find, 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 find Jesus. We never follow Jesus. Why? Because we are the crowd, we are not the disciples. We look for blessings, we never look for service. 
We look for things. We never look for Jesus. We go to prayer to get the blessings instead of getting, going to prayer. It's like I go to my wife and I say, I want the soup. I don't need you. I just need your soup. You understand what I am trying to say? How many times do you go to prayer and say, Lord, I do have needs, but I'm not going to ask you anything. I don't ask you to heal me. I don't ask you to help me. My, my foreclosure, my marriage, my cancer, whatever. Those are real needs, but Lord, I have other priorities. I don't want your blessings. I want you. You understand? How many times do you pray that prayer? I want you more than life. I want you more than blessings. I want you more than health. I want you, period. When I am with you, I need nothing. I want you, Lord. I want you. Like my grandpa and my grandma. When, when he died, two months later she died. She says, I cannot live. I cannot breathe without him. The treasure. The treasure. The treasure. What is your treasure? What was the treasure in the parable? The Christ object says that the treasure is the gospel. And then she continues in the next sentence. is the good news that Jesus died for you and he wants to save you. The treasure is Jesus. Jesus is the treasure. You found Jesus. That's wonderful. The problem is that if you really found Jesus, you need to surrender all. That's what we don't understand. You need to take the second step. We go to church and we never take the second, the third. We get out of Egypt, but we never get to Canaan. We just turn around in wilderness. The man hid the treasure. What is it to hide the treasure? He says that I hide thy word into my heart that I may not sin against thee. But listen, if you look in the Hebrew, he says, I store thy word into my heart. To basically, the, the Bible says that men don't live only with bread, but with any word. The Bible says that Jesus said, you need to eat my body and drink my blood. You remember? That Jesus has to be an IV. You know what is an IV perfusion? Yeah. Jesus has to become an IV perfusion that goes into your body, into your blood, into your cells. Has to be bread and food that goes into your cells. You have to not only find Jesus, you have to dig deeper every day and digest and eat Jesus and, and get him in all your cells, in your brain, in your life, in your work. Jesus has to become bread and air unless Jesus... Unless you hide him in your body, you never grow. That's the reason we go to church, we get baptized, we get out of the water, and we still struggle. Because when you get baptized, you don't give your life to Jesus. Did you know that? You don't give your heart to Jesus when you get baptized. You give only a corner. And everything else you keep for yourself. You get out of the water, you still have the pride, you still argue, am I right or wrong? You still are selfish, you see. Except me, everybody else does that, you know. <laughs> because when we get baptized, we decide to follow Jesus, but we don't give the entire heart. We give a corner. And the I says, surrender is not an event of baptism. It's a lifelong, I put it in my words, it's a lifelong daily process. Where step by step, we surrender more and more and more and more of the heart. Daily, we never stop surrendering until, she says, he takes over the whole heart. Then, she says, he can transform us, grow us, use us. The reason we don't get transformed, the reason we don't get victory, the reason we have no influence over others, is because we don't follow this process of daily surrendering another inch. You follow me? And God is calling you to hide it, to digest it, to inhale it, to breathe it, to eat it, to basically be baptized in Christ and put on Christ. The man sold everything. If anyone comes to me and doesn't hate mother, father, the easiest one to hate, mother-in-law, doesn't hate brothers and sisters and his job, and it, is not worthy to be my disciple. Is not worthy to be my disciple. Listen carefully. The word in Greek is not hate. It's Misheo. Misheo translated, it means to love less than. To love less than. Whoever comes to me and doesn't love those things less than he loves me, he may go to church. He is not a Christian. He is not an Adventist. He doesn't belong to me. You need to love God more than you love the others. And that happens at the cross. You cannot do it. But at the foot of the cross, says in the side of ages, as you reflect 
His sacrifice. The more you understand that love, she says, the more God fills your heart with his love. The more you love him, and the more you love him, the less you love the others. And the more you get of Jesus, the less you have time or focus on other things. And the way you surrender more is by spending time with Jesus to the degree that you love him more. His love, as it grows, it pushes away the love for other things. It replaces, it fades away the love for other things. You understand what I am trying to say? That's how we grow. You don't change yourself by human efforts. If you try, good luck, keep trying. You change yourself by keeping your eyes on the cross. We are changed by beholding. Now listen carefully. Sold everything. Sold everything. This is extremely important. It's not only that you sell a little but that you sell everything. And that means, that means that you go deeper in all you do. For instance, you don't pray because you are supposed to pray. You pray because you want to know Jesus. You don't study because you are supposed to study or to know the doctrines or whatever. You study because you want to know Jesus and to be with him. You don't go to church because it's the right thing to do. You go to church to find Jesus. You don't serve because the pastor asks you. You serve because Jesus is in your brother and sister. Basically, whatever you do has one focus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name of all. You know? Anyway, it's Jesus that is the center of your life, that is the treasure of your life, that you are ready to live or die or whatever he says because you love him. I told you the story. When I put my eyes on my wife, I was in the church. The pastor was preaching. I could not care less for the pastor's sermon. I had a spring on my neck, and my neck would always automatically turn to the alto. I was at the tenor. My wife, my girlfriend, she was not even girlfriend, was at the alto, and I was just always looking at her. I was hypnotized, like... And people say, turn your head forward. I say, okay, and then back. That's what you do with Jesus. You fix your eyes and you don't turn it. That's how you grow. That's how you surrender. How much must we sell to get the treasure? How much are you willing to sell to get the treasure? The rich ruler says, what can I do to inherit eternal life? You don't do. You belong. You need to belong to Jesus. I'm going to go... I need to jump probably. I'm going to jump a few slides. Give me a second. I need to jump a little. He bought the field. What is the field? Christ object lessons. The field is the word of God. Listen, folks. If you really love Jesus, you love prayer and study of the word. You understand what I am saying? If you mean that you want to find the treasure, you sell everything, all your territory, not only the bad stuff, you sell the good stuff too. You sell your righteousness, you sell your arguments with your spouse, you sell your right to be right, you sell your time, you sell everything. You sell everything and then you invest all in buying the land. What does it mean? You spend time in prayer and study because that's how you get closer to Jesus. You spend time. You spend time with him. I need to jump over. By the way, every single time we ask him to help us surrender, we get in trouble. Every time we get in trouble, we say, Lord, please solve it. And he can never work because trouble... All things work together. God allows trouble to develop you. And we, instead of growing, we want to solve the problem. And when you solve the problem, you don't learn patience. You don't learn trust. You don't learn faith. You don't learn humility. You never graduate. You just want God to bless you and to solve your problems. You say, Lord, give me patience. And then your boss or your spouse bothers you. And you say, Lord, help my boss to leave me alone. And God says, didn't you ask for patience? How in the world are you going to learn patience? And so instead of asking God to solve your problem, ask God to help you graduate so you don't have to repeat the class again. 
Now, I want to uh, emphasize something that we really don't understand. Paul says, in Ephesians, Paul says, Paul says, and to find him, then to be one with him, and he says, I consider how many things? I consider all things, how much is all? I get a translation from Greek. You know how you translate all? All. That's how you translate it. He says, I consider all things, between verse 7 and verse 8, he repeats all things, I consider all things a loss, four times in two verses. He says, I consider all things a loss, and then, and I consider all things a loss four times. And he uses last time, I consider all things, not a loss, but he says rubbish, that in Greek is animal excrements. I consider all things animal excrements that I may find in Jesus. Now, I want you to understand, Paul found Jesus in year 33. Okay? Keep, keep in mind. And now he writes Ephesians in year 62. So it is 29 years later, after he was serving, he was beaten, he was in vision in heaven, and he says, I want to find Jesus. We need to understand that this is a lifelong endeavor. Basically, you don't get baptized. You need to daily seek more of him, more, of, more about Jesus, more of him, more and more. Unless you do that daily, you are not a Christian. That's the reason we have problems in family, problems in the heart, problems in the church. Because daily, like Paul, I want to know him. And he doesn't say, I want to be one with his blessings. He says, I want to be one with his death. I want to be one with his cross. I want to be one with his sacrifice. So I may be one with his resurrection. How many of you pray and say, Lord, I want to be one with your death? How many of us pray that? We say, Lord, would you heal me? You understand? When you surrender, it's all about Jesus. Nothing about you. He shall increase, I shall decrease. He shall live, I shall die. I die daily. I no longer live. He lives in me. He is in full control. Listen, it's easy to keep Sabbath. It's difficult to give up control. We are control freaks, aren't we? Yeah. We like things the way we say. But when you find Jesus, you sell control too. You sell everything. Let me give you an example, and then we jump to the end. We are at slide 13, and we have 43 slides. It's better if we finish. If you are serious about the treasure, you are serious about relationship, you are serious about study and prayer and service, you are serious about commitment, you are daily looking for Jesus in a daily passion to find him, to get more of him. That's when you grow. You surrender more and more and more and more and more to the degree that eventually he takes the whole heart. You love him so much that no sacrifice is too great because of your love for him. His love for you and your love for him surpasses any desire for anything in life. That's Christianity. It's a daily growth to the degree that Jesus lives in you and you die. Who wants to die today? That's what it takes. You will never live before you agree to die. I want to finish, and I am trying to jump to some, uh, to some paragraphs that I had here for you. I don't know where they are. Doesn't matter. Really doesn't matter. I'm going to give you a story and we finish. I, uh, I have a, one of my former, one of my former elders, who, was, who is an eye doctor, he's the head of the laser eye surgery clinic over the whole state in the US, I'm not going to tell you the name or the location, very good, very good, very good, excellent Christian, <coughs> a third generation Adventist, faithful, serving the church, supporting the church, coming, being involved, very good Christian, but very well to do. And that's not a problem, you know. Praise the Lord. Money are not a problem, you know. When you love money more than God is a problem. Let everybody have money. Amen? Amen. Okay, praise the Lord. So, he, very good Christian, very good Adventist. And I said to them, I said, let's go to Cuba. Let's go to four locations and build four churches in places where there is no Adventist presence. Let's do evangelism, baptize people, and let's do that every once in a while. Go to a country and reach unknown territories, blank territories. You follow me? Let's do that. Because as we serve, we grow. And they said, okay. And he comes to me and says, Pastor, 
I'm going to give the money, but I don't come. Why not? I don't want your money. I want you. He says, Pastor, it's not comfortable. Cuba means no warm water. You know, cold water means no good food. It's, 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 it's not comfortable. I said, praise the Lord, it's not comfortable. Come up. Come with me. And he talked to his wife and to his daughters. And they said, okay, we come. Can you find a quality hotel for us? I didn't. We went to Cuba. There were three groups. One bones doctor, this eye doctor, and me. Each one had five people in the group. I was one hour south of Havana. The bones doctor was three hours west from Havana. And the eye doctor was seven hours and a half west of Havana. In three locations with no Adventist presence. And we started Thursday night evangelism. We prayed, we divided the money that we raised. Everybody had an equal amount for advertising, for books, for Bible workers, for transportation, for this and for that and for that, for evangelism. Money for hotel, money for food, for everything. And we started evangelism. Thursday night, late, he calls me and says, Pastor, I'm in trouble. The police came, they want to arrest us. I said, what have you done, brother? Nothing. They came and they said that we don't have the proper papers. They confiscated the books. They confiscated the money. They took everything. And they said, if you try to do evangelism again, we are going to put you in prison in Cuba. He says, can we come and join you? I said, absolutely not. God put you there. Stay there. But what if I go to prison? I said, hey, Joseph went to prison. You know, enjoy it. Maybe you come prime minister of Cuba. Who knows? Like Joseph, prime minister of Egypt. <laughs> Pastor, I don't want to go to prison. I said, do you love Jesus? Yes. Are you ready to suffer for Jesus? Yes. Then go to prison. No. I said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. You love Jesus? Yes. Then why are you arguing? I said, have you prayed about it? Yes. How much did you pray? I don't know. Tell me how much. I don't know. Brother, if you don't know, you didn't pray. You remember what I said last night? If you fast one minute, you don't know. If you fast five days, you know. If you pray one minute, you don't know. If you pray three months, you know. If you don't know how much you prayed, you didn't pray. He said, how much do you want me to pray, pastor? I said, until you get an answer. He said, well, put it in time. Five, ten minutes. I said, hello, you don't know English. Should I say it in Romanian? Until you get an answer. What if I don't get? Then you keep praying. And if I don't get an answer after I keep praying long, then keep praying more. Grab Jesus like Jacob and say, I'm not going to let you go before you answer. You send me here, so you better kill me because I don't let you go. He says, you mean that? I said, really? Are you asking me that question? He got the whole team, including the children, and they started to pray at 9.30 p.m. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And he told me next morning they prayed until 2 a.m. And he said, I've never prayed so long in my life. And I, I, I was born. Can you be born an Adventist? He said, I was born an Adventist. He said, I've never prayed so long in my life. And he said, after about half an hour, we really started to mean it. And after about two hours, we really started to plead. And we said, Lord, we want to reach this city. We want to reach Cuba. Lord, please. Please intervene because only you can intervene. <coughs> and he said, by 2 a.m. we had peace. We didn't know what, but we had peace. And we started to sing and we stopped. And he said, I went to sleep and God woke me up with a thought. Go to the police officer who came and confiscated everything. So he said, Pastor, I'm going to go to the police. I said, God bless you. Go to the police, baptize the police force. <laughs> we were praying for them. He went to the police next day. He called me. He says, Pastor, you will not believe. I said, try me. He says, I got to the police. I went inside. <clears throat> I said, what can I do so you allow us to do evangelism? And the guy started to scream, get out, I'm going to arrest you. And then he waved with his hand and said, don't say anything, wait. And then he went to the radio and turned the radio on with music, loud. So nobody could hear us. And then he came to my ear and whispered, do you have a Bible with pictures for children? He said, I don't want anybody to hear. I will lose my job and my freedom. Do you have a Bible for my kids? And he said, yes, we do. Can you bring one? Also a normal Bible for my wife. Can you bring one? Okay. I've never seen chocolate in my life. Can you bring a few chocolates? Yes. Okay. Listen, put them in a bag, put clothing over it, meet me in the town in front of that restaurant in the afternoon. I said, I'm going to tell you what to do. You don't have the proper papers to do evangelism in a public building. But you don't need that paper. You can do it in a church. Just talk to the churches around, rent a church. He called me, Pastor, 
I met the police officer, I gave him Bibles and chocolate, I'm going to go to the churches in the town, rent a church, do evangelism. God answered our prayer. I said, hallelujah. And then he called me next morning. Pastor, I went to the Baptist church, I went to the uh, uh, Anglican church, I went to the Pentecost, I went to the, I went to the, I went, none of them allowed me. I thought it was God. I said, yeah, Israel got to the Red Sea too. I said, I don't remember a time when you follow God and it's easy. If it was easy, it would be Satan. If it's difficult, you know. If Satan attacks you, you know it's God. Keep praying, brother. Keep going. Go back to the churches as the woman and the judge. Go back until they kick you out. Go back. He went second time to all the churches. When he got to the Baptist church, <coughs> the Baptist pastor says, Listen, <coughs> our roof is broken. We have no money to fix the roof. If you pay for us to fix the roof, I give you the building for free. He said, How much do you need to fix the roof? And the Baptist pastor says, 2,500. So this elder talks to his wife, honey, how much money do we have left over? And she says, well, the money for evangelism are all gone, confiscated. All we have left over is for hotel, 2,500. And he calls me, pastor, I have only 2,500, that's the hotel money. Can you give me more money? I said, no, if I give you from my oil, none of us have oil. But pastor, I need to do evangelism, give me 2,500. I said, brother, I don't have 2,500. And I said, you do have Pay that. He said, but that's the sleeping money. I said, you need to surrender that money. No, 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 I need to sleep. No, you need to surrender your sleep. Pastor, I need to sleep, I need to eat. I said, no, I am slim, I need to eat. You, you don't need to eat, you can fast. <laughs> Give the money. He says, pastor, it, 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 pastor, it, 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 pastor, you are asking me to give the money for hotel and for food? Yes. I said, don't expect God to give you anything before you use whatever you have. He says, Pastor, we are a whole group. We have children. Where are you going to sleep tonight? I don't know. Give it all. Pastor, what are you going to eat tonight? I don't know. Give it all. He says, whoa, that requires something that I've never done. I have always done from out of my reserves, but not all. I said, brother, it's time for you to sell all. He was quiet. He went back to his wife. He talked to the whole team. They prayed about it. He called me crying. He says, I determined to give it all. What happens to us, I don't know. We are in a foreign country. We don't have a place to sleep. We don't have food. They slept in the van, all of them, that night. And they had no food. In the morning, he says to his wife, Honey, in your purse, you always have everything. You know, in a woman's purse, if you turn it upside down, you can start a whole store with it. He says, in your purse, you have everything. Maybe you have a little cash. Maybe we can get a bread. And she looks in the purse and she finds an envelope, 2,500. He says, honey, you forgot to give the Baptist pastor the 2,500 for the roof. He calls the Baptist pastor, I'm so sorry, I forgot to give you the money. The Baptist pastor said, no, 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 you gave me the money. I have them in my hand. He calls me, pastor, did you give me another envelope of 2,500 by mistake? I said, I never give more by mistake. I may give less. He said, the angel of the Lord put 2,500 in my wife's purse. I said, praise the Lord. He called the whole team. They celebrated. They paid the restaurant. They ate. Next night, they paid the hotel. <clears throat> By the way, they started to do evangelism in the Baptist church. And the Bap there were 16 people plus the pastor. <clears throat> Next night, 156 people. He says, who are these people? And the Baptist pastor says, I came last night to hear you. I like what you say. I call my whole church. And he told me, and now I know that all things work together. If the police didn't come, the Baptist church would have never come. Pastor, now I know. I said, well, you should have praised God before you knew. He says, rejoice always, even in your trials. Yeah, now you praise God because you know you need to trust him before you know. And he says, Pastor, I'm happy. I said, praise the Lord. He says, Pastor, and we gave all the money, and we found the envelope, and we ate, and we slept in a hotel comfortable. I'm happy. I said, praise the Lord. And we have 156. I said, praise the Lord. And then he calls me in the morning. Pastor, you not believe what happened. I said, what? He says, I counted the money today. Last night I paid hotel and food, and today I counted, we still have 2,500. <laughs> and I thought we didn't count properly. But we paid for today the hotel, and then I had my wife count the money. We still have 2,500. And then he called me next day. He said, I paid hotel. I paid food. We counted the money together, the whole team before, and we counted the money after. We still have 2,500. 
I had them in front of the church give testimony in front of the whole church when we came back from Cuba. Every day they spend money from the envelope and every day the envelope has still 2,500. I told him, I said, give me that envelope, please. <laughs> I said, no, you need to sacrifice all. You need to step out in faith. You need to pray because I was ready to go to prison. I was ready to sleep in the van. Now you need to do the same, Pastor, if you want that blessing. <laughs> they planted the church. They baptized a bunch of people. They finished. Ten days later, they came to Havana. We all met to Havana. And they still had 2,500. We gave the money to the union for other needs there. That man came home, a changed man. And he said, I've been an Adventist all my life. And I've done the forms all my life. But I've never fully surrendered. I was afraid to surrender. What's going to happen to me if I surrender? And he said, I didn't trust my Jesus because I thought I loved him, but I loved my comfort more than him. You understand, folks? Yes. We are afraid to trust God. That's sad. And God calls you to daily surrender all. To daily get your family around and say, Lord, I give you my family. Do what you want. Lord, I give you my job. I give you my health. I give you my time, my money, my car, everything I am. It's yours joyfully. I give it to you. Do what you want. If you want me to lose my job today, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know you love me and I trust in you. Lord, if you want me not to get to work today and you have another plan for me, do what you want. I surrender my time. Daily pray that prayer. Daily surrender all. Because to the degree that you surrender, to that degree he takes over until he can transform your heart. People who don't surrender never experience transformation, never experience power, never save anybody. Because only as you surrender, God can use you. And in the moments that you surrender, God works in your life. And then when you go back and protect yourself, God again cannot work. God is calling you. And me, to daily, total surrender. Would you say yes? We had to stop. We don't go through. We stopped somewhere, whatever, doesn't matter. Listen, folks, it has been a joy and a privilege to be with you. I'm very happy for, of what I heard last night, that there was a group of people praying the whole night. Praise the Lord. When you leave this place, take it home wherever you go. And all that you have heard. If the Holy Spirit touched your heart. If the Holy Spirit touched your mind. If you felt that the Holy Spirit spoke to you. Take it home. And implement it. Don't expect others to do it. Do it yourself. Look for Jesus. Get more of Jesus. Fix your eyes on the cross. Get to know him. Get to love him more than anything. Surrender all daily. Because the more you surrender, the more you think that you lose, the more you actually get. Whatever you are going to surrender is going to be blessed, multiplied, saved, is going to grow, is going to influence you, is going to influence others. In Jesus' hand is the single place that is actually secure. You understand? Would you make a decision today? Would you turn around within families? If you don't have your family, somebody close a friend and pray over them and say, Lord, I pray that you and me talk into the friend. I pray that this friend and me, my spouse, husbands, pray over the spouse, over the wife. Wife, pray over the husbands. Pray over the children and say, Lord, I surrender my family. I surrender my children. And then pray for one another. Lord, help us to surrender. Help our churches to surrender. Help us to be yours without any, 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 to sell all. To die for you. To die daily. Because to the degree that you do that daily, you don't need to worry about transformation. You don't need to worry about growth. All you need to worry is to keep your eyes on him and to surrender. He will take care of all the other things without you knowing. 
He's going to work to circumstances that you don't understand. And He is going to make sure that you are God ready, that you are saved. He is able to do that.